Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to season two of Mind Split Cafe. This is our first episode back from break. I couldn't be more excited. Uh, Matt and I were out in the valley. We had a couple different meetings in the off season. Um, also, I want to congratulate Saddle Up Podcast. They had a great event there at the university back home. Uh, super happy for them. So excited. Thanks. Um, but Matt, let's get into this. What do, what do we got today? We've got none other than the the, the world renowned Carl Nasser. So, Carl, thank you so much for joining the show today. We are so excited for you to be here. Yeah, thank you, and thank you. For yeah, for calling me world renowned. That was kind of you. <laughs> <laughs> it's only the first the first episode back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're we're definitely stepping up in season two. So, uh, Doctor Nasser, you you reside in fort collins you were kind of telling me but what is it why are you here kind of give us a brief background and then we'll get into you know what exactly you do but kind of give us a little bit about your 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 bio if you could yeah absolutely i uh, just really briefly i got to the field of psychology the very long way growing up my parents said you can be a doctor or an engineer those are the safe careers where you can make enough money and be secure I don't know why, why Lori didn't make it, but Lori didn't make the cut for whatever reason. It was doctor, engineer. Uh, I went down the engineering path, got a doctorate degree in engineering. So I guess uh -huh. I did both in a funny sort of way. Um, came to, to Fort Collins, Colorado to teach at Colorado State University in the engineering department. Uh, stayed on for seven years, got tenure. And then uh, with my wife's support, but to my parents' dismay, I left the uh, academia, academia altogether. Got new degrees in counseling psychology. I ran a private practice for a while, about 10, 12 years. Turned that into a group practice that grew and had about 300 people working with me across the state. Uh, handed that off a couple of years ago to some other folks to take over. And have now gotten very engaged in this idea of culture of mental health and how they are interwoven together. Um, and very excited to be talking to you today about all that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm beyond excited. I know off camera I mentioned to you that uh, the you you have a bunch of topics we want to discuss, but the the two psychology and neuroscience. Uh, I was explaining to you that's that's my favorite topic. That's my favorite way to go. So I'm I'm beyond excited to have you on here. Yeah, thank you. So uh, well, I can jump. Right yeah, you go ahead. I was going to say jump right in. Take take a leap for it and let's go. Yeah, I want to start. I would love to start us somewhere because there's something really fascinating that I think people often don't realize. So we look at um, the history. You know, when we we tend to think that the world we live in is normal, right? We look around us and we say this is normal. <laughs> um, but if, it's very interesting. If you look at the history of human, if, if the history of humanity on the planet, about two hundred thousand year history, the period we were born into is remarkably strange. It's mm -hmm. remark. It's it's really an oddity, for 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 almost all of that two hundred thousand years, all but maybe the last twenty thousand years. So for that first ninety percent of the time, by and large, people lived in what were relatively small villages, mm -hmm. lived very much together, and lived very much these interwoven, interconnected lives. Mm -hmm. And when you were born, there were forty pairs of eyes excited to see you, and forty hands guiding you. Um, and here we are, um, you know, all of a sudden growing up and we don't grow up in a, we don't grow up in these villages that were really, really, we were many ways born for. Um, we grew up, we, we arrived at this very slender, narrow moment in history where we arrive in this marketplace and it's a very different world. Um, it's a world that wants us to survive and very much on our own, um, whereas we evolved very much together. Um, and, you know, as we talk more a little bit about neuroscience and psychology, what we'll see is that, you know, we were very, our, our brains are very much wired for the villages that we were born into. In fact, our brains evolved in those settings. Um, and, and the psychology tells us that we are very much, uh, we very much belong to each other. Um, and so there's mm -hmm. this, this, this gap between how we evolved, how our minds, how our bodies came to be where they are. And then all of a sudden we find ourselves in a place that's incongruent in many ways with that way of being. Mm -hmm. 
That's interesting. I, I mean, there are so many questions that are running through my mind right now. I've never really thought about this this part <laughs> of the topic. Um, I mean, this is this is great, uh, but I do want to kind of pinpoint one thing. Uh, you did mention that we evolve. We evolve mentally, physically. Uh, we evolve to what we perceive as normal or what the society perceives as normal. Let, let's jump into neuroplasticity real quick. Um, can you explain that for our listeners a little bit and how that plays into what we were just kind of talking about? Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the, our brains are not these solid blocks of st structures. They are, they are fluid. They are living organisms inside of us yeah. and they evolve. They, they grow. They're, our brains are very, our brains have tremendous plasticity when we're young, which is in part why our early childhood experiences have such a role in shaping us because our plasticity is, is um, high when we're very young. But even as we age, our brains don't lock in place. They remain very, um, very, very open to change um, and very open. And as if, as our environment around us changes, um, our brains will change with them. Um, it's why when we get married, um, you know, we, we change who we are. Uh, our, our, our marriages change us, for example. Yeah, no, that, that is, is definitely true. So, you know, when they say that you become a product of your environment, does that have anything to do with neuroplasticity and, and you become who you are because of what you've taught during the times of your brain being molded? I think I think there I think there's two factors, right? Now you're talking about nature and nurture, mm -hmm. right? And they're and they're both there, right? We know that there are certain characteristics people tend to come into the world with. People tend to lean more toward introvert or more toward extrovert, for example. So we are born not blank slates, right? That Freud originally Freud's original proposal is people came into the world blank slates. We now know with certainty Freud was mis misguided in that statement that we arrive with a def definitive, anybody who's had a kid knows, we arrive with a definitive sense of who we are. Mm -hmm. um, and, they're, and, they're, and that being said, we also learn about ourselves and our world through the people around us. We look at how people respond to us um, and we look at what, what part of ourselves they excited to see, what part of ourselves they disappointed by. Mm -hmm. And we begin, to, we begin to shape ourselves in relationship the people around us very much. And what we see with people is that what carries very much from childhood above all else are relational patterns. Um, how we learn to relate to the significant people around us when we're young often shapes how we relate to other people later in life. Do you think it can change though? Like, I mean, given the, like, let's say you have a, a you know, a, an individual in a really, really messed up environment growing up but then yeah. through change of circumstance whether it be career opportunity whatever you know they they come out of that you know situation they're they're kind of built themselves into another situation do you think that they can uh, you know change how they view the world or how they you know view relationships or love or care or sympathize like do you think that can change based on the environment? Absolutely. In fact, you know, I mean, <clears throat> I wouldn't be a therapist if I didn't believe that could change. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, really, really something as simple as the act of therapy, coming in once a week and having a safe place to come to. See, wh what people need that they often didn't have is they need a safe container. Mm -hmm. They need a place into which whatever they felt could come out of them and be heard. Right. I mean, we do live in a culture that has a sort of a certain level of forced positivity, right? We ask people how they are and the right answer is I'm okay or I'm good. Mm -hmm. You know, worst case, well, it's a little bit rough right now, but I'm getting through it. Right. We, we tend to, to, we tend to mitigate. We sort of, that, uh, what's that old British war slogan, something and carry on. Um, you know, it's this idea that we are supposed to just keep going and, it's only a flesh wound and we're okay. Um, yeah. You know, you know that, I always, I always use the, I always yeah. use the, the, um, the response, you know, people ask, how's it going? Well, I could complain, but nobody's listening. Right. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's just one of those things where, like right. you said, it's kind of a flesh wound. You just 
move on about your day. It'll get, you know, it'll get better or it it could get worse, but it is what it is, right? There's nothing yeah. you can do about it, you know? So it's, it, that's a, and it's, there's a wonderful, um, forget who taught, there's a Ted talk and the fellow in the Ted talk said something quite lovely. He said, look, he said, look, if you broke your leg and you were limping along, right. And you, for a few days, you're limping along. Somebody would stop you and say, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. He said, well, you know, I, I, I'm okay. I can limp, I can limp along. I can get by. Okay. Right. And the people would say, you're nuts. Go to a doctor, go get, you know, go, go get healed in some way, you know, and you mm -hmm. wouldn't just limp along for 30 years. Cause that's just your leg broke. Right. You, you tend yeah. to, we tend in our culture not to think about our emotional well being that way, but it is very much the same way, you know, that, that if you allow people to come into a space where they can share their experiences and share it not just from a cognitive place, but actually from a feeling place and allow themselves to really let out so much of what they had to hold in. Because as, as you just said, Matt, there was nobody there for them to, mm -hmm. to receive it, right? I could complain, but there's nobody who's going to listen to me, sort of a statement. Um, come on in, you know, come on into the therapy setting, complain, let it let it out have that have that experience of not having to hold it in so tightly um and what you find is is as people start to allow themselves to tell their stories um in a rich emotional way they naturally begin to change that neuroplasticity starts to click kick in and they start to allow themselves to feel more and more okay with who they really are instead of feeling they have to they have to be who the world needs them to be mm -hmm. Well, this is this is like therapy for me, like being able to talk to to, you know, we produce my company produces several podcasts, but you know, hopping on being a co-host for Mind Split is is definitely therapeutic for me because I get to talk to great you know people like yourself and and kind of get a different perspective, and I get to talk to people and they listen and it's free therapy, right? So it works out. So. Yeah. That is true. You, you know, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the forced, um, like forced of being okay or forced to say you're okay. Uh, you know, everyone says that, hey, how are you doing today? I'm fine. I'm good. Never really go into detail or never really become vulnerable and explain, hey, I'm not doing okay. And I believe this is part of the stigma that the mental health industry is is fighting off right now is that people are afraid to say they need help. People are afraid to ask for help. And, and in reality, you know, our mental well-being is is one of the most important puzzle pieces to overall health. So having said that, what is the, and I know you're going to like this one, what is the psychology behind that? Why cognitively or, or psychology, why do we think that way? Why are we forced to hide our vulnerability? Yeah, so this is very much a cultural narrative, far more than it is an innate narrative. Um, you know, we grow up in a culture where the people that are here for us are really only typically one or two parents, and they themselves are exhausted. And, they themselves are exhausted and isolated from um, having to survive in a consumer culture, having to make it on their own. Um, they themselves have their own traumas and their own grief that is usually unresolved. And these are the people that we have to grow up around. Um, and as much as our parents love us, and I would say by and large for the, for the vast, vast majority of people, our parents love their parents love their children deeply. As much as they love them, they themselves are compromised. And there's no way that one or two people trying to work and take care of all the household chores and the cars and break the leaves as we did this weekend and all those many different things. Um, there's just no way they can be there for their kids in a way that it tends to those relational needs to be validated. Um, that relational need for security that they, <clears throat> they can be there consistently loving them um, and, you know, offering that sense of care that, that mm -hmm. they consistently need. And so kids end up in this place where, sometimes their needs go unmet or sometimes they express part of who they are and their parent, their parents don't like that part of who they are. You mm -hmm. know, don't stop your crying. I'll really give you something to cry about, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, whatever it might be. <clears throat> and so you, you know, so you learn that parts of you aren't okay. Parts of you shouldn't be shared. 
mm-hmm. you should tuck those away because they're not wanted. I mean, after all, if your own parents don't want to see this part of you, who in the world's going to want to see that part of you? Yeah. And so what happens early on in our child is, is we, we split ourselves apart. There's the part that we say, this is an okay part to be. And these are the parts that aren't okay to be. And we push those parts away from ourselves. And in this culture, a lot of what we push away from ourselves are what the culture calls, even the word is, our negative emotions, right? Our anxiety, our fear, our mm-hmm. sadness, our anger. We push all these very natural expressions of ourselves away. And then when somebody comes and says, how are you? Well, I don't want to tell you this part because you're not, you're not going to, you know, even my own mom and dad didn't want to hear that. You surely don't want to hear that. So let me just share with you the parts that I think are going to, that you think I'm a good boy or a good girl or a good guy or a good teammate or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like. Well, it gives a whole new it gives a whole new perspective to that you know that age old saying it takes a village, right? So to to raise a, a child, right? And it kind of goes back to what you were saying, and that's what stuck with me is that we have gotten away from that small village setting, or you know the like where you where you help raise the individuals in you know the neighborhood or the 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 village, right? And now it's more isolation you know and and i think this is fascinating that you've dedicated your career to to studying this aspect of what you do right i I just kudos to you yeah absolutely yeah thank you i I agree with that so going back to kind of our, our initial conversation or the first part of this um what is your specialty when it comes to clinic? When you're seeing patients, what do you see patients for the most? And what is your favorite modality to use? Yeah. So I tend to be a longer term therapist. Um, I tend not to be this sort of short term six mm-hmm. session. Um, let me give you a few tools to help you through the depression you're, you're experiencing and off you go. Um, Because by and large, a lot of the data says that you can do that with people and it's effective. There are effective tools that you can give people within a handful of sessions to help with their depression. But most people will come back six months later and say, okay, I'm depressed again. I'm back. Um, (laughs) I'm back because there's usually something deeper behind it. Um, There's usually something, you know, as I was, so my, 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 my work is very much this. Um, I think about it from the perspective of, by and large, most people never really had a reliable, dependable person with whom they felt that they could really have a secure relationship. <clears throat> it was just safe to be whoever they were. Mm-hmm. And they could say whatever was there. They could share whatever feeling came up. They could share whatever thought came up. There was no good, bad part of them. All of them was okay. All of them was welcome. And so my intention is very much to create that space that welcomes all of who that person is so they can feel safer and safer sharing more and more of who they are in relationship with me. And so that they become more and more comfortable being and embodying all of who they are so that they can then take that, what they've done with me and now live that with other people mm-hmm. so that they are no longer bound by what part of them is good, what part of them is bad, but that they are in some ways, there's an inner village inside of them where all the parts are welcome. All of who they are is important. Every part of them had a story to tell that was worth hearing. And I want to hear every story from every part so that all of who they are can emerge. And then they can leave here as a whole person, able to come, able to interact with the world and make decisions and have relationships based on the richness of all of who they are. And that Mm -hmm. lets people be the gift that they are to the world. Because we are really here to be ourselves and allow who we really are to then shape the world. But if we're busy hiding ourselves away because we grew up having to hide parts of ourselves, then that that deprives ourselves and the world around us of a richness that we all need. Wow. Just out of curiosity, before we before we promote your website, right? How people can find you, do you do online sessions? Like do you or do you only see people in like the Fort Collins um, Colorado area? Yeah. Yeah, no, I work with people online as well. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. And yeah, you know, and, and I'm I'm trying to one of the things I'm trying to develop. I've, I've started a uh, an organization called the Great Culture Lab, um, and the idea here is very much around how do we build spaces where people can come together 
and mm-hmm. as and as small communities be that for each other mm-hmm. so that they can find each other in very sincere real ways and in some ways recreate at the very least the emotional strength of a village if not the actual shared land of a village wow wow that's interesting i i would love to uh, get some more information on that some resources that we can put up for our listeners too i think that's a a phenomenal I, idea i believe your website uh carl com, correct yep that's it yep okay great carl with the c correct that's right yep right. yeah carl com. you can find him yeah we're 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 blessed to have you today we've got about five more minutes left in the in the show but is there anything that you would like to leave our audience with um, like a, a kind of a going away message or, or something that you're really passionate about and, and uh, that you'd like to say? You know, this is going to sound funny, um, but I'm, but I want to say this cause then I'm curious how it's going to come, how, how it's going to land. I'll be curious as I say it. Um, what I, what I want to say is it's not your fault. That's a funny thing to say. Um, hmm. I, I think in our culture, you know, I certainly I don't want to diminish the importance of personal responsibility. I'm not trying to in any way suggest that people should not take responsibility for how they act. Um, but what I want to say is that I think that we've been too far that way in our culture. Um, and we tend to think that every, uh, I'll speak for myself, I can lean sometimes to where thinking that everything I feel that I don't like that I feel is my fault that I feel it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you know, and and what I want to say is, look, where we are today is hard. It's difficult to be in a consumer culture. This is a culture that tells you that your value is measured by how much you produce and how much you in some ways and what you have. Right. Mm-hmm. The you know, look, Elon Musk is successful. Right. These are the successful people of the world. Right. The celebrity actors are successful that we, the culture tends to measure our success by how much we produce. And then boy, look what I have, look at my nice house. Oh, look how successful they are. They have that very nice house at the end of the, at the end of the cold, cold de sac. Mm-hmm. Um, we tend to measure ourselves in this way. And that's a very difficult culture to live in because you're always left in some ways feeling you have to prove your worth at all times. Um, and it's very different than living in a culture where the what's valued most is your relational self. That mm-hmm. Matt is just enough because Matt is just this wonderful relational being. And Chris is enough because Chris is a wonderful relational being. And Chris doesn't have to prove his worth in any way to, to belong. And Matt doesn't have to do anything to be welcomed into this circle of, of life. That, that you're, you're, you're welcome in such a way that your worth is guaranteed. Um, that's what villages gave people. They gave people the certainty that they were always welcome. So they never doubted their worth. Hmm. Um, whereas in this culture, we always feel like we have to prove our worth in order to earn our place at the table. And that's a very difficult world to live in. And so I just want people to hear that I'm not trying to say, then don't try by any stretch. I mm-hmm. just want you to acknowledge that this is hard hard that the world we live in is challenging in very unique ways and that's why it's especially important now that we find each other so that we can feel our worth with each other without feeling that we have to spend our whole life trying to prove that we're enough amazing Uh, yeah i I love that uh you i like how you went full circle from the start and you ended it right back where we started i think that's awesome and i i I, what, what you just said is super true everyone knows it everyone feels it that in this world in this society we quantify our lives by materialistic things what we have what we don't have what someone else has that we want um so i I appreciate you throwing that in there and and kind of coming full circle with it i think that was great message to relay that's a great way to end the show thank you carl for 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 joining the show and giving such wonderful insight because i'm gonna step back and the rest of the day i'm gonna really think about my value my worth what i what i determine you know what i look at and i determine what is successful in my worth and value and i think i'm going to reassess exactly you know 
what that means in life, you know? So I'm me personally, I'm blessed, but I'm always, I'm caught up in that rat race. Like you were saying, like, okay, Hey, the, the nicer house or the, the successful, you know, income or whatever it is, I'm caught up in that. And so I'm going to really reassess this afternoon. What, when we edit the show, I'm going to really think about what you said. So thank you for leaving us on that note. Yeah. Thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate giving me this opportunity and thank you both for, for creating the show so that people could, so you could re reach out to people and relate to them in these really important ways. Appreciate well, we, being a part of it. We appreciate you, Carl. Thank you so much. You bet. Chris? Uh, to the listeners, again, thank you for sticking with us through season one and starting season two with us. I know we had a, a couple week break in there, but thank you for staying engaged, asking questions and emailing during our break. Uh, we're excited for season two and what we have to uh, bring to the table and see you next uh, Wednesday. We're back, guys. Thanks, Carl, again. And you can go to carlnasser.com, C-A-R-L-N-A-S-S-E-R, -S -S -E correct? A-R, N-A-S-S-A-R. S-S-A-R.com, carlnasser.com. Thank you so much, Carl, for joining the show. We'll see you next week. Take care, guys. Bye, everyone. Like we weren't supposed to come up with something this clean, you know, like something happened.